our existence, our actions, and our behaviors can be explained away by mathematics. Specifically, game theory. It's an area of mathematics which studies strategic interactions and can be applied to anywhere an interaction takes place. But did you know that there were five discoveries without which we would never have modern game theory? In order to understand the strategic thinking behind this and how we've gotten to explore this problem, we need to go back to the Middle Ages, where everything started in studying gambling. But don't worry, we won't spend too much time on that, because I know it's kind of cliché. Girolamo Cardano's Liber de Ludo Alea, or Book on Games of Chance, is considered one of the earliest systematic treatments of probability. Cardano was a Renaissance mathematician, physician, and gambler who lived from 1501 to 1576. And I guess the gambling was exactly why he was interested in studying probability, right? Oh yeah, he wanted to make money. Exactly, so for example, he would calculate the probability of rolling dice. If we take two dice, there are 36 possible outcomes. To find the probability of, say, rolling a sum of 7, Cardano would count the combinations that result in 7. 1, 6, 2, 5, 3, 4, and the vice versa of each, which are 6 combinations he'd find that the probability of rolling a 7 with 2 dice is 6 out of 36, or 1 sixth. But I mean, it's kind of obvious now, isn't it? For us nowadays, yes. But it was innovative for the time. So, Sophia, I have a question for you now. Do you think there were limitations to his approach? Well, I imagine he couldn't have covered everything, right? Obviously, probability is way beyond gambling and dice. About a century later, Blaise Pascal and Christian Huygens took those ideas and push them into what we now consider the modern mathematical theory of probability. Their discussion centered on what is now known as the problem of points, or the division problem, which deals with how to fairly divide the stakes if a game of chance is interrupted. Imagine us as two players in a game, and we agree to play five rounds. Each round one earns a player one point, and the first player to win three rounds wins the game. Suppose we've played four rounds, and you lead two to one. But we have to stop playing. How should we divide the stakes? Pascal devised a way to solve this. Calculate the probability of each player winning if the game had continued. You need only one more win to reach three wins, while I need two consecutive wins. The possible outcomes are you win the next round, A, you lose in the next round but win in the one after, B, A, you lose two rounds in a row, B, B. Based on combinatorics, there are three scenarios where the match can end, and you have a chance to win in two of them, A and B A. The chance of me winning is only one scenario, B B. Thus, the fair division based on their current chances would be, you have a two-thirds chance of winning, I have a one-third chance of winning. Therefore, if you were playing for a pot of, let's say, 90 bucks, it should be divided as 60 bucks for you and 30 for me, based on our probabilities of winning. Christian Huygens expanded on Pascal's ideas and published the first full treatise on probability, on reasoning in games of chance. He introduced the concept of expected value, which provides a way to calculate the average outcome of a probabilistic event. Suppose you're offered a game where you roll a fair six-sided die, and you receive the number of dollars shown on the die, and the expected value of this game helps you to decide whether it's worth or not to play. The expected value E can be calculated by the following. This means, on average, you would expect to win $3.50 per roll, providing a straightforward method to analyze the game's fairness or value. These contributions by Pascal and Huygens not only solved practical problems in gambling, but also laid down the mathematical foundations that would be so important for the development of game theory. I love how it's all connected to gambling. And what do you think about calculating probabilities in a more competitive scenario? Not just cooperative ones, like dividing stakes. Well, if you know your chances and the potential outcomes, you could use that to figure out your best possible moves. Yeah, and that thought leads us to the 20th century, when a mathematician named John von Neumann developed what's known as the Minimax Theorem. The Minimax Theorem states that in zero-sum games, or games where there is one winner and one loser, like chess, there exists a strategy for each player that minimizes the maximum loss they can expect to suffer, hence the term Minimax, minimizing the maximum possible loss. This strategy ensures that a player is secure against the worst-case scenario, regardless of the opponent's actions. 
the theorem posits that there exists an equilibrium point defined by a pair of strategies for the players. This equilibrium is known as the Nash equilibrium, named after John Nash, who expanded on von Neumann's work. If, if you, you guys, guys are enjoying, enjoying this, this video, video, please like, like and subscribe. And subscribe. <laughs> In this state, neither player can improve their payoff by changing their strategy alone, assuming that the other player's strategy remains the same. Von Neumann's approach involves the use of payoff matrices and linear programming to determine the optimal strategies for players in a zero-sum game. Each possible action by a player corresponds to a row for player 1 or a column for player 2 in a matrix. Each cell in the matrix represents the payoff to player 1 if the corresponding strategies are chosen by player 1 and player 2, respectively. A strategy for a player in this context is defined as a probability distribution over possible moves. This might seem excessive for simple games like tic-tac-toe, but it is definitely necessary for more complex games. Each player chooses a strategy that maximizes their minimum payoff, considering the worst case to best response by the opponent. The strategies are found by solving a linear programming problem. And in this problem, the goal is to maximize the minimum expected payoff by a player. Suppose X is a vector representing the probabilities with which player 1 plays each strategy, and Y is a vector for player 2. The payoff matrix A contains the payoffs to player 1 for each combination of strategies. The game's goal for player 1 is to solve the following. Conversely, player 2 aims to solve this. The Minimax theorem guarantees that there exists an equilibrium where one equals the other. This equality states that the best Minimax strategy for player 1, maximizing the minimum payoff, equals the best maximum strategy for player 2, minimizing the maximum payoff. So now I have a question for you. How might we think about extending these ideas beyond winning or losing? What if the outcomes have different values for different players? Do you mean considering how much each outcome actually matters to a player, like not all wins or losses might have the same impact on them. Yes, and this brings us to the concept of utility theory. Utility theory was formally introduced by John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern in their seminal work Theory of Games and Economic Behavior in 1944. Von Neumann and Morgenstern's approach was to reintroduce and formalize Daniel Bernoulli's earlier theory of utility, specifically the utility of money using an axiomatic system. The purpose of a utility function is to represent the player's preferences. The higher the utility value, the more preferred the outcome is. The utility numbers themselves do not have any intrinsic meaning. They are just a way to rank preferences. For example, if outcome A has a utility of 10 and outcome B has a utility of 5, it means the person prefers A over B. The actual numbers 10 and 5 are not important by themselves. They are just a way to show that A is preferred to B. Mathematically, if a decision maker has choices that lead to different outcomes with different probabilities, the expected utility E of U is calculated as this, where PI is the probability of outcome I occurring, and UI is the utility associated with outcome I. Every pair of outcomes can be compared. A player can always say if he prefers one outcome to another, or are indifferent between them. Preferences are consistent across choices. If a player prefers outcome A to B and B to C, then they must prefer A to C. If a player prefers outcome A to B and B to C, there must be some probability mix of A and C that the player finds equally preferable to B. This axiom allows for the introduction of probability into utility theory. Using these axioms, they propose that rational decision-making under uncertainty can be modeled by the expected utility function, which is calculated by multiplying the utility of outcomes by their probabilities and summing the results. Subsequent researchers extended these ideas to cooperative game theory, which considers how groups of players can form coalitions and enforce agreements to improve their collective outcomes. We've talked about how people make rational choices to maximize their benefits. But what if making the best choice for yourself end up being bad or being the worst for others? Do you mean a situation where the choice is the best for one person, but isn't the best for the group? Exactly, and this is known as the prisoner's dilemma. It shows how people making rational choices for themselves can end up worse off than if they had cooperated. The concept was originally framed by Merle Flood and Melvin Drescher while working at the Rand Corporation in 1950. However, the form in which the dilemma is most commonly presented today was formalized and named by Albert Tucker. 
who sought to make the scenario more relatable. The scenario typically involves two prisoners suspected of committing a crime together. They are interrogated separately and cannot communicate with each other. Each player has two options, to confess and testify against the other, or to deny committing the crime. The outcomes depend on the combination of their choices. If both prisoners confess, betray, they each get a moderate sentence, for example, five years each. If one confesses and the other denies, the confessor is rewarded, for example, goes free, and the denier receives a heavy sentence, let's say 10 years. If both deny, they both get a light sentence, one year each, due to insufficient evidence. This creates a situation where each prisoner's dominant strategy is to confess, regardless of the other's decision. The dilemma arises because if both followed their dominant strategy, confess, they would each receive a worse outcome than if they both cooperated by denying. The game has a single Nash equilibrium, if played once. This solution is stable because neither player can unilaterally improve their outcome by changing strategies while the other's strategy remains fixed. But in an iterative version of the prisoner's dilemma, where the game is played multiple times and players remember previous moves, more cooperative strategies can emerge. In the early 1980s, political scientist Robert Axelrod held computer tournaments to explore outcomes of the iterated prisoner's dilemma. The most successful strategy was tit for tat, devised by Anatole Rapoport. Imagine two players, you and I again, playing the prisoner's dilemma over five rounds. Round one. You cooperate. I cooperate. As a result, we both receive a moderate sentence. Round two, you cooperate following your strategy. I betray. I go free. You get a long sentence. Round three, you betray, copy my previous move. I cooperate because I felt bad. The result, you go free. I get a long sentence. Round four, you cooperate, copy my last move. I cooperate. We both receive a moderate sentence. Round 5. You cooperate. I betray you again. I go free. You get a long sentence. So essentially, the strategy is copying the previous move of the opponent. If you cooperate, I cooperate. If you betray, I betray. Sorry, but when in the world is this useful? I mean, I get that the example is super simplified, but I'm really struggling to understand where the application lies. Well, it's a tough question, but if you know the answer, Leave a comment below. This is the end of game theory. Obviously, there were other concepts that mathematicians played around with, like the core, the extensive form game, fictitious play, repeated games, etc. But that is at least where the foundation lies. If you're curious to know more, check out this video right here. I'm pretty sure you're gonna like it. Yeah, for sure, 100%.